We have on the show today an expert on silver. David Morgan is the editor of the Morgan Report, and he is here to talk about the macro outlook for not just silver, but other key commodities that you need to be following right now. David, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to have you here on Kitco. Well, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. All right, let's talk about uh, uh, a broad overview of all commodities, not just silver. So as you know, inflation has hit a, a multi-year high, or multi-decade high rather, of 9.1%. Uh, but then the last report that came out uh, not too long ago was 8.5. So a slight uh, fall in headline CPI right there. Now, the commodities uh, prices have been falling in tandem with that uh, report. In fact, some analysts have speculated that the reason we had a lower CPI in the last CPI report was because commodities have been falling. Most commodities, most hard assets have peaked around May and like lumber, copper, uh, a lot of other base metals, they've been falling ever since then. Food prices have also been falling. Is this a trend that you think will likely continue, David, as we head into a global slowdown? Do you think commodity prices will continue to soften? I do, and that's great insights and thanks. I'll just gonna add on to that a bit. First of all, the trend will continue. Secondly, we are seeing a contraction globally, which means we're going to see less need for copper, uh, lead, zinc, the base metals. Every base metal is off this year, except I think tin and one other, I think nickel. And all the rest of the base metals across the board are off somewhere, somewhere around 30% in some cases. I just did that on my weekly blog. Uh, the metals are a unique uh, set because they represent money or financial stability. So you could have gold and silver, perhaps platinum, palladium, making moves higher while the copper, lead, zinc, base metal complex falls off. And that's what I expect going forward. On the uh, other parts of the commodity sector, oil's been weak relatively from what it's been. However, the agricultural commodities are in dire straits. We've had all kinds of problems throughout the globe with locusts, weather problems, uh, too wet to plant, to dry to plant, all kinds of reasons that the foodstuffs globally are hurting. And that's not going away. That trend will remain for probably the next couple of years. There's also, if you want to get into it, the climate change less uh, monitor minimum, what goes on in these solar cycles. I don't want to go too deep. The point is that stuff we need, uh, food and energy is probably going to continue higher. And then on the silver side, I'll have to interject there. I get off and mm -hmm. asked, you know, well, you know, what about uh, silver and what's happening with a slowing economy and an increase in cost because oil is directly related to mining. Some cases, 25% of the costs are due to like diesel. Well, that could be higher, but it's going to curtail the base metals like I just said. So since 70% of silver is a result of base metal mining, if that is down and down noticeably, that takes a great deal of silver supply off of the market. And that's what I actually expect. Is it gonna be like huge? I don't know. I don't think it's gonna be huge. I think it's gonna be measurable. And I think we're gonna have, even though we might have better pro, uh, production from primary silver mines, the overall will be less because we're dropping, contracting, and seeing lower living standards going forward, probably for the next few years. Sorry, just to clarify, you're saying that rising energy costs are going to uh, restrict silver production and limit, am I understanding that right? Yeah, there are limits to everything. And if the costs are too high, the input costs for mm -hmm. mining in general, it could cut back. In other words, for example, Take like a Pan American uh, that has sure. several mines around the world. There's some mines that are very marginal and they'll just shut them down and put them on maintenance and quit mining out of them because the cost level for that particular mine is, is not economically effective. That's a very interesting perspective. Everyone's talking about uh, silver rising from an ESG perspective. You got the greenification of the economy, needing silver for a lot of industrial applications, which we'll talk about now or later on in the interview. But you're saying that more immediately, a supply shortage is going to push up silver prices. It's going to have a significant impact, actually, David, on the price of silver or not at all? Well, you just talked about. It. Yeah, well, it could. I mean, you know, I'm forecasting what's going on in the global economy. I think I'm yes. pretty accurate at it. You know, there's a lag. I mean, but markets usually forecast the future. So if I'm correct and believe I am, 
you could see a, a push in silver prices because of lack of base metal mining and higher costs. So some mines will become inefficient and not economically viable. And so that will cut the supply on the primary silver miners and on the base metal miners, which means kind of a double whammy. I don't want to build too strong a case here, but it is in the cards. In fact, I did uh, in the Morgan Report a few months back, I got a question from one of our members, you know, what's going to happen? Oil's, and that was an oil was spiking, right? And what will it do? And we w did a whole, the whole editorial was about the best, most effective use of money when you're in the mining sector and why you wanted to follow our advice in that sector. I won't spill the beans because I'm paid for my research, but there are, there is a certain segment in the mining space that's much more effective and not nearly as um, tied to energy costs than, let's say, straight up mining. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, which regions you think in the world will be most affected uh, by rising energy costs and hamper their production? Would it be mines in North America, South America, perhaps mines in Africa? Is it, is it dependent on the region or not at all? Somewhat it is. Uh, you know, it depends on their, again, their input costs. I mean, mm -hmm. if your, you know, input costs are less than another nation state. The other is the real uh, situation with the geographical location is what are the implications for labor and what are the implications for environmental protection. So if you are in, uh, let's say, South America, in many instances, there's really not strict labor law like there are in the US and Canada, where you've got to provide, you know, healthcare coverage and, you know, insurance on the employees and all this stuff. Those costs to a large extent don't exist. Also on the environmental side, although it's pretty pervasive throughout the world, most places you need to do some kind of an environmental study before you start mining. But some places are very lax and other places are very strict. That adds to cost. So obviously in areas that are more favorable labor-wise and environmental-wise have lower costs, even if diesel costs the same everywhere, because their input costs are obviously less. And this is something that's not really discussed in the mining industry right. that much. But part of the reason that almost all of the rare elements come out of China isn't because China is blessed with a lot of REE. Sure. It's because it's so toxic and cost ineffective to do it in an environmentally friendly way, they just look the other way and let China process it in a very unenvironmentally friendly way and uh -huh. ship it back to us. Um, some gold miners, not silver miners, but some gold miners have told me that uh, energy costs are a relatively small percentage of their total costs. For example, Yamana, they claim that 5% of their total costs come from, uh, come from oil and gas that go into their uh, trucks and drillers and whatnot. Um, I'm just wondering if that's uh, different for silver miners, whether or not energy costs are a large percentage of uh, their operating costs, David. It depends on the mine. I mean, if sure. you're in like a large open pit and you've got these huge tractors, I mean, these things are so huge. I don't know if you've ever seen one live. I know you've seen it on you mm -hmm. know, a documentary, but I mean, yeah. you can stand next to the tire and they'd have to put three of me to on top of each other just for the size of the tire. Okay. Those are basically driven, you know, diesel machines that are very, uh, yeah. very um, costly on, on the price of diesel. Because that's an open pit. On an underground hard rock mine, you got a different dynamic and it wouldn't be uh, as costly. So it really depends on what you're mining, where you're mining, and how you're mining. I'm, I'm just curious, going back to your uh, statement about rising energy costs, I'm just curious to why you think energy costs will rise, given that uh, currently some would say that we're already in a recession. Do you, uh, normally during a recession, you would you would see uh, demand for energy go down, no? Is this time different? Correct. No, you're correct. But, you know, it is supply and demand, and we're at or maybe just past the energy cliff. <clears throat> I'm a big believer in the, the peak oil situation. Mm. What we're seeing is, Inefficiencies in the fracking sector, really there's very few places that fracking makes sense from an economic standpoint. And then you're seeing depletion that is taking place rapidly through uh, different parts of the world. Um, you know, behind me in this bookcase is Twilight in the Desert, written by Matt Simmons years ago, talking about Gawar, the biggest oil field in the world, and how it's uh, being depleted and that the amount of oil 
or the flow rate is so much less than it was initially. So I think that uh, it's going to be the supply that is going to be the driving factor, even though demand's going down noticeably, I think the supply will be go going down at a higher rate. And that means what I just said, higher oil prices. Mm -hmm. Interesting analysis. Well, let's talk about the demand side for silver then. I keep hearing that uh, you know there's going to be a surge in silver demand over the next 10 to 15 years from a variety of industrial usages. Do you agree with this statement for silver? And uh, what are these uh, industrial applications that need so much silver? Yes, um, I'll answer that. I just want to thank you publicly, David, for having Matt Watson on. I know that you interviewed him. A lot of... Uh, Look, the forward-looking statements I'm making right now come from Matt's work. Uh, I consider him, you know, friend. He certainly picked up the phone every time I've called him. Matt's so there's a lot in, going with the photovoltaics. A lot of take Germany for example. They're the leader in solar in the European area, and now with what's going on with the natural gas market in Russia, they're probably more inclined. There's a lot of legislation through different jurisdictions. For example, California, any new home that's built has to employ solar. It doesn't have to employ it 100%, but it has to use it. So when you looked at a pie chart of silver's usage, um, they never broke out solar until about 2019, so three years ago. And the Silver Institute put on their pie chart that the solar usage in 2019 was about 9% of the solar industry, okay? And now it's probably around 12. And that's going to continue to increase. So that's the main driver. Uh, a lot of people make a big deal about electrical vehicles and that electric vehicles use more silver. And that's true, but it's not as substantive as many make it out to be, but it certainly will be additive. Another one is the semiconductor industry, which most people don't talk about. Semiconductors take 44 million ounces of silver on an annual basis. And I've jokingly said with my tinfoil hat, David, that I wonder why they're having trouble with <laughs> semiconductors. Could it be silver? I have to digress a bit and try to throw a little humor in here. But you may recall, David, that there was a statement made by <clears throat> the U.S. Mint that there was a worldwide silver shortage. And that came from the Mint Master of the U.S. Mint. And he quickly retracted that statement. And I don't think there is a worldwide silver shortage. It's just, if you look at what the mint is producing now, they're not able to keep up with demand whatsoever. And the margins, what makes a market, okay. and the mandate for the mint is to produce as much silver eagles as the country demands or the market demands, and they're not. Well, let's explore that a little bit here. Let's, uh, we don't have to go as far as to put on tinfoil hats, but that statement that the, uh, the uh, Mint Master made was quite, uh, was quite interesting. Why do you think he retracted that right away? Was it a mistake? I think it probably was. I think what he was actually referring to is it was harder for them to source what's called blanks or planchettes in the mm -hmm. industry, and they just weren't getting enough you know, smooth metal that they stamp into an eagle. I think that's what he was actually referring to. So when it said worldwide silver shortage, believe me, it got the silver community really, really wound up. <clears throat> well, speaking of sh silver shortage, I, re I recall the uh, Matt Watson interview that I did. Uh, uh, you're right, he is very knowledgeable. And I believe that he said that in about 20 years or so, uh, we will run out of silver if we assume that uh, what there, there will not be enough silver in, in above ground reserves, I think is what he said, to service the uh, the amount of silver that should, in theory, be needed to to produce everything that we need to produce: solar panels, electric vehicles, and so on. I mean that that that's not uh, we're not talking about, of course, mints and, uh, and 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 coins. We're talking about industrial usage of silver, not enough silver being be, uh, being in reserves around the world uh, to to service our demand. Is that a concern that you have, David? Absolutely. And it was actually first stated by the USGS, United States Geological Survey. They basically said that silver would be the first element to leave the, on the periodic table that will be in such short supply. And that was a few years back. And uh, based on Matt's work and my own, others, you know, I, I take a lot of input. Uh, just the industrial side alone is probably going to take, you know, as you outlined, 
all the silver available at some point in time, and that's off in the future. I would say this, uh, as far as a long-term investment or a legacy investment, if you're in your 20s or 30s and you've got you know a new family and you want to put your son or daughter through college, I would commit some to the silver market because I think if you've got a long uh, time horizon, like 10 years or more, uh, I can't think of something that's more uh, that would be better than a silver investment. You don't have to go whole hog or buy too much. But uh, certainly the, the legacy type of investment going from generation to generation, I think uh, silver will shine at some point, probably beyond what anyone thinks. But it's probably going to take what I call a natural corner. What's, how do you corner the silver market? Well, you buy up all the silver that's available. And, of course, that's been tried by the Hunt brothers and it's been tried in the past. But uh, that isn't necessary. A natural corner is when industry alone sucks up all the silver that's available and there isn't any left. And that's an extreme. I'm not saying that's exactly what's going to happen, but that's a general trend. And I think we need to pay attention to it, especially if you are a silver investor holding silver and, let's say, long-term storage because you expect the price to increase right. over time. 